oh my God, what's going to happen today is going to make history here at Hunkfest. We are making history, and this is what we need today, everybody. This is our shining example of how to make change happen. Those of you enjoying this on video, whenever, welcome. Sit yourself down, enjoy the symposium, understand that there are hundreds of booths here selling hemp products, you name it out there, and um, this place is about to get really crowded. So, enjoy. So today, we're going to start off with a media panel. How do we really affect change? By changing the media, because it really needs changing. And here we have Sean Apple from Our Trees. Morgan Fox, the liaison for uh, the media liaison for the marijuana policy project. We got Ungayo Bilum, who's uh, a moderator of his own. He, this is uh, the funniest guy out there and the best MC we got in the movement. But um, today he's wearing his real hat, his work hat, which is being the um, uh, editor in chief of the uh, <laughs> <laughs> cannabis. Uh, West Coast Coast Cannabis Magazine. And we got Russ Bilville, who took a senescent normal media and um, made it real and, and brought normal back to life in the modern media. And we got Steve Elliott, who's took of the town and uh, a column that he writes in the Village Voice Online um, um, column. And he's uh, also our um, um, dispensary uh, a critic. Now, wouldn't you like to be the dispensary critic? Everybody else, Hell yes. you know, wants to be the food critic. You know, to be able to walk in a restaurant and go, oh, oh, well, she's here. And, and take care of her really well, or whatever. But Steve gets to do this with dispensary, so I want to hear about that. I'm going to let Ungayo kind of lead things while we still get things set up here. Oops. Yeah. He's going to lead things off. And off. We'll just kind of watch things for a minute while we just get, sure. you know. Just watch uh, things, keep an eye on everybody, hold on to your wallets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Don't let the government take it. You want to start with Sean and work your way this way, I guess, it would be the right way to go? Sure. And, and um, let's be a little loose. This is usually the Donnie you show. I'm Donnie. And, um, and um, uh, so... If you have any you know, questions, just raise your hand or something. Get to do that, and I can run out and talk to you. But it's better that you come up here in front of the speakers so we don't get feedback. No, okay? And uh, go ahead, Sean. Okay. Well, I, I just flew into Seattle last night, and uh, boy, was I high. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm from Our Trees, which is a community, a cannabis community on on the little website known as Reddit, and uh, so I, I'm very proud to be here. Uh, and so our trees, within one year, uh, we started from a, a little uh, sapling and we've grown to 105,000 subscribers and millions of page views and we're using social network, social networking to affect positive change and, uh, and uh, that's, that's why I'm here, so thank you. Well done. Hey, it's uh, Morgan Fox, I'm the uh, communications manager at the Marijuana Policy Project. Um, I really just kind of want to talk about uh, television for a little bit. Um, national uh, TV is probably one of the most important uh, media uh, outlets that we can go after just because it gets the most number of views. Uh, clips from national TV are the ones that get posted on blogs and get spread around a lot more. That's what really grabs people's attention. And we've definitely come a long way in getting access to national media. I mean, um, in 2002, uh, one of my uh, predecessors uh, tried to call CNN to pitch a story. And uh, the receptionist had to put him on hold because she couldn't stop laughing. And when she brought him back, uh, her response was, all right, Mr. Marijuana, what should I uh, say uh, you want to talk about? And uh, in 2008, they were calling us. I mean, we've really come a long way, but now that we have access to it, uh, it's becoming uh, very much a double-edged sword. Uh, it's become harder to control the, uh, the messaging and uh, harder to get stories pitched the way that we really want them to. Uh, because, I mean, quite frankly, the media cares about drama. They don't care about facts, they don't care about truth. All they care about is what's going to get the most views. And for that, they want drama and uh, conflict. So the trick is to try to uh, get these guys to focus on the conflicts that we want them to, as opposed to the conflicts that they find mo the easiest. And 
the way that we do that is, I mean, first developing relationships with producers to make sure that we can pitch them the type of stories that we need to, but also by creating our own conflicts so that we can control the messaging. That means uh, calling out legislatures in public forums so that uh, people will start to, uh, you know, ask questions and, uh, you know, maybe put them on the spot a little bit. They love it when politicians are embarrassed and start stammering. We, uh, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> um, instead of them uh, just waiting for them to find their own stories and going after things like conflicts within uh, ballot initiative campaigns or conflicts within the movement or, uh, you know, that, uh, that one dispensary owner who's got a bunch of AK-47s in the back. You know, um, we need to get them to focus on the conflicts that we want them to because those are the juicy stories. They don't really care about, uh, you know, how this bill is going along unless there's some sort of hook. And uh, as we like move forward and try to get uh, more and more media coverage for this, uh, really, I mean, we can't find anybody that's going to debate us on this issue anymore. And I've tried. Uh, so many times I'll be talking to uh, producers and they say, well, we want to do a segment on this, but we can't find anybody to uh, be the uh, other side of the debate. I'll do it. <laughs> Masquerade is a drug warrior. I'm sure. Well, what about the children? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but uh, those are the things that we need to really concentrate on, uh, creating conflicts that the media wants uh, to look at. And that means we have to really try to go out there and embarrass the people that are working against us. But of course, in like a polite way. Um, right, no cream pies. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, that's really all I've got. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free. Let me... Uh, uh, Jump in on that. Ungai Obilam, editor in chief, West Coast Cannabis Magazine. Please meet you. Um, I like. I think it was Gandhi who said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win." So it seems like that we're past the laughter stage, and people are starting to take cannabis a little more seriously. And that's why you see a lot of documentaries, you see a lot of shows, and like you said, the slant because they are going to fight it. The slant has kind of changed a little bit. It used to be a little way more open-minded. In the first couple of years, but the last one they just had on Frontline, I thought was tilted a little more toward the DEA, who was clearly lying, than than toward uh, an or even balanced or even more pro cannabis agenda. So I think that's the challenge that you say to create the good content for that. And also, I think you know, even not just national programming, but uh, like local programming. I used to do a show called Cannabis Planet, and it came on in Los Angeles and Sacramento. And I tell you, I was shocked at the amount of response that I got from people that. I wouldn't even have thought were pot cannabis users or just people who watch television. They're like, oh, I'll go watch that show. So there's things like that you can do to spread the word. So put together your own cable access show. That's my advice. Also, another good point is to make uh, make sure you call people when they're uh, you know misrepresenting the facts. I see uh, a doctor and a kid over there uh, from uh, Montana, and in during the, all the legislative uh, you know nonsense that was going on there, uh, the people that were getting the most press were safe community, safe kids, and the media didn't bother to check their facts, so that comes down to our responsibility. And the best way to go after those guys is to publicly confront them. Be like, prove that kids are selling their bodies for uh, medical marijuana in school. You know, come up with the figures that you're saying that uh, you know all these kids are uh, you know abusing this program and so much uh, marijuana is getting diverted from it. You know, if we call them out, then it becomes a story that the media wants to follow. That's a good point. Yeah, I got I, a point to follow up on that too. Uh, by the way, my name is Russ Belleville. I'm the host of Normal Show Live. We have. 10,000 of these to give out, so please take one. It's uh, basically talk radio. It's our own talk radio network. Uh, I host the Anchor Show, which is news and interviews and uh, you know comedians and music and all sorts of stuff, a rant from time to time. We're on every day, weekdays at live.normal.org, absolutely free, one to three Pacific time, so check that out. But uh, with what Morgan was saying about the, the fact-checking and speaking up, there was an interesting event that happened with Normal uh, just a little while ago. Paul Armentano, our deputy director, uh, called me up, and he was putting together this article that was a rebuttal to some drug warrior article. I forget who it was. It doesn't matter. But the drug warrior article was typically full of the... the but what about the children? Yeah, what about the children? What about the stone drivers? There's going to be you know loss of uh, uh, productivity at work. There's going to be more access. You know, all the things that we know not to be true... But, you know, no fact-checking required whatsoever on their side. Now, on our side, Paul's Did writing... Did you know that 85% of all facts are made up on the spot? He's absolutely right. So Paul is uh, writing the rebuttal, and he gets a hold of me, and he says, well, Russ, how many uh, arrests have there been in, you know, the time period? And he gives me... And I said, well, 20 million. There have been 20 million marijuana arrests. And he goes, okay, do you have the citation for that? I'm like, well, yeah, it's the FBI Uniform Crime Report. Okay, and so he, he emails back to whoever... And so he comes back and he goes, well, is there one location where it has that 20 million number? And I said, well, why? He goes, well, because 
they're saying that there's no uh, citation for 20 million arrests. And I go, oh, okay, well, it's FBI Uniform Crime Report 2009 plus 2008 plus 2007 plus 2006 plus 2005. All of them are linked. All of, it's like they wouldn't accept from our side just a simple number of how many people had been arrested, even you know, because it wasn't in one place, right? They don't like to do math. They'd have, actually have to do math. Yeah. Uh, so what I like to do in uh, trying to change the game here with uh, talk radio, and it's something that I picked up from, you know, I was originally a progressive talk radio host on satellite uh, radio, and learned a whole lot about how the conservatives dominate the talk radio airways. And it's because they've learned marketing and they learned how people's brains really work. People on our side, us open, communicative, progressive, even libertarian type folks, we tend to think people follow reason ah, and facts ah, and logic and stuff. Ah, it doesn't work that way. People uh, vote emotionally, they think emotionally, and the right wing has seized on that. They, they found ways of reframing things. For example, when I was a kid, being a liberal wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Now it's a dirty word because they attached it to nasty frames. Limousine liberal, tax and spend liberal, you know, all these terrible things. And now even liberals don't like to call themselves liberals. They've sullied that word. And on the other hand, conservatives took something that wasn't necessarily thought of well, conservatism, kind of miserly, kind of military, and turned it into compassionate conservatism. George W. Bush, the compassionate conservative. So along that line, I, I prefer think, the term right-wing nut job. <laughs> that, that's good, too. Uh, so what I think that we need to do is, and, and we are starting to do this quite well, I think, is thinking of, about our messaging and how we come across to people. For example, uh, when medical marijuana was you know, blazing through, pardon the pun, through the 2000s, the buzzword was compassionate. The Compassionate Use Act, the Compassionate Care Act, Compassionate New Hampshire, New Hampshire Compassion.org, and so on. Now, with uh, with uh, marijuana legalization, it seems to be sensible, sensible regulation, sensible Oregon, sensible Washington, sensible Colorado. So we are learning how to rephrase and, and reframe our arguments uh, to, to get through to people a lot better. And finally, I think uh, the media is starting to sway to our side. I remember when I started analyzing it, it was always, if there was like a CNN panel or whatever, it was three prohibitionists and one guy on our side who got like three minutes and they all got five each because they'd filibuster. Now I'm seeing where it's like two of our guys against one of theirs, or like Morgan saying, our guy and then no one else showing up to, to, to debate him. I mean, that's, that's showing some progress there. But there's still a lot of long way to go. I mean, this panel was called, you know, Beyond Pot Puns or something like that. Something like that. Something like that. There was a new story. I prefer cannabis conundrums. <laughs> I just did a story on Wednesday. We're going to let Steve speak sooner or later. I'm sitting there so patiently. I know. I'm like sorry. the last piece of bread in a <laughs> last one. sandwich bag. Just, well, I hope they make a sandwich out of it. I'm sorry. I've but been the, smoking hash. I'm kind of rambling. Go ahead. Just this last Wednesday, I did a story for this Massachusetts company. Headline, Massachusetts company unlocks genetic sequence of cannabis. I just saw that. Yeah, and then you get down into the story, and a little line in the story says, and we're hoping by mapping the genetic sequence that they can weed out, pardon the pun, the psychoactive effects that get you high. Like, pardon the pun. That's funnier if you don't say pardon the pun. You just yeah. put it in there like you're smooth. Yeah, nobody would accept that if it was a story about we discovered the genetic uh, sequence that uh, no, leads they, to homosexuality. No, they'd do something for beer. They'd be like, brewing up the genetic sequence for beer. Yeah. That's, so, that's how writers work. I'm not mad at that. It shows they're hip. <laughs> hashing out, I've seen that headline like, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries hash out new ordinance. Yeah, or, or something like that. Prop 19 goes up in smoke. Right. <laughs> new regulations. Let's be blunt. Yeah. Steve Elliott. Hi, I'm Steve Elliott. Hi, Steve. I edit Talk of the Town, which is Village Voice Media's blog of cannabis news and views. Um, I'm also pot critic and dispensary critic for Seattle Weekly. I won't lie to you, it's a hell of a good job. Um, <laughs> It's not something I ever imagined myself getting paid for when I was a teenager in Alabama, getting busted for pot on a regular basis, five times by the time I was 25 How years old. How is the pot in Alabama? Um, back in the 70s, I can tell you it was good because it was Colombian gold. Nice. Um, Robert Platshorn shit that he used Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was Mexican around too, um, but there's always grades. Uh, I think what we're facing with the media is it's a value neutral mechanism. The function of the media is to make a profit. We live in a capitalistic society. So what that makes the media a lot like is a fire. That media can cast light or it can cast heat. And unfortunately, a lot of times when it comes to the issue of marijuana, 
the media is casting a lot more heat than it is light. I think the task of us, of those who are lucky enough to work in the marijuana media is to cast more of that light and less of that heat. And at the same time, we have to operate within that paradigm of getting those page views. When Village Voice hired me in November 2009 to run Toke of the Town, they told me, and this is a quote, just get page views, I don't care how you do it. So I thought, okay, I can do that, but I don't have to pander to the same old negative stereotypes about pot to do it. I don't have to make the same old dumb associations and just run this thing into the ground like it's been going forever. I saw that as a chance to forward the debate a little bit, and that's what I've tried to do. And uh, the same goes for Tote Signals, which is the dispensary reviews I do for Seattle Weekly. I know that a lot of patients, when they come onto the scene, are, are very confused by the vast array of choices they have to make, the, uh, the places that are available to them, who's going to treat them right, and who is it. The function of Tote Signals Isn't is... Isn't that amazing? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm still amazed, and I'm from California where we've had dispensaries for a very long time. But every time I walk into a new spot, I'm still amazed and, and just it's just beautiful that it's not even like, oh, I hope my guy has some. It's like, which one of these clubs is the coolest? Well, that's amazing. We've come a very long way. And that's, it's thanks to things like HempFest and people getting together and having websites and, and doing media outreach and all this kind of shit. So stay sure. active is my point. Okay, sorry. Keep there going. aren't many bad reviews in that, by the way. But if Oh, uh, I saw one just last week, dude. You savaged those dudes. If a shop, <laughs> if a shop doesn't do right, I mean, I'm going to tell it like it is. I, uh, that's just what it's got to be or else the reviews don't mean anything. That's but. integrity, brother. I'm with it. There's only been a couple of those, so uh, I, I consider it a privilege to, to help the patients that way and um, a great privilege also just to have the chance to get out the truth about marijuana. Yeah. Do you guys, does anybody have any questions about anything? All right, brownies just kick in or something, you know? <laughs> yes, madam in the purple. It's a community, it's, the name is Our Trees. And is it O U R trees? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's reddit.com slash r slash trees. And a lot of people just call it R trees. It's easier to remember. It's a uh, community that started from nothing, just a couple people who, uh, who uh, loved cannabis and loved dis discussing cannabis openly. And it has evolved very organically into this um, amazing community of uh, people who are very open-minded, people from every state in the union and people from all over the world who are able to discuss cannabis at their leisure and uh, find like-minded people. And, uh, um, and in fact, uh, we attract a lot of people who don't even uh, use cannabis, people who just enjoy the, the general sense of friendliness that they find in the community. And that's something I'm really proud of with it. Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T dot com is like an online community. It's, it's what do you call it, like a news feed? I mean, because uh, people aggregator. come in an aggregator. So if you find some story online, you can put it on your Reddit account or send it to your Reddit community and everybody can read it and share it and form on it and talk about it and things like it's that. It's kind of like you think... pretty much how it works? Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. Right. So, right on. You can vote up or down on Reddit stories and that adds a, a democratic element to it, a democracy element. People, if they like the story, they can vote it up. And uh, when those stories get voted up, they rise to the top of the Reddit charts and it works a lot like Dig, which works on the same principle. And those sites can get you a ton of page hits when something's at the top of the charts in them. And, uh, it's great to have a cannabis friendly community like our trees there to get the word out to all the people who are interested well thank you reddit's a great uh and uh dig and things like that are fantastic the uh i can't underestimate how useful they are at getting people to spread news stories for you i mean it's like free media uh, any social networking facebook twitter i mean that's how we get our stories out there. Do you think the internet's going to be more important than the television? Like you talk about how you like to be on the national television all the time. Do you think that it's one day going to surpass it? Or do you think the television is still way far in front? Or are they about even now? What do you think? Um, in terms of people like actually getting involved, uh, I think that internet is probably more important. But just getting the casual people, the swing voters, uh, television is still far the right, best way to get uh, just eyeballs. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, I would say that's one of the things... Maybe one of the drawbacks of the internet is you can definitely just look at only the things that you want to look at, right? So in terms of drawing new people to the crowd or whatnot, it's not always 
the best way. T television or something like that is probably because people just watch TV. One thing that the internet that the internet does have going for it is the uh, democracy part of it because almost anyone can start a blog and if if they start kicking good information out there they're liable to get some attention. I, I mean that's how I got in this thing. I was blogging about it on my own personal blog as if someone were paying me and they weren't for the first few years. Uh, that fortunately got some attention from the right people and it led to a paying gig. Yeah, I think this, uh, I think internet is one of the best things we've got going for us. I've always said, uh, when it comes to the drug war, when we're talking about it, we're winning because we have you know, truth, facts, and logic on our side. We just need to get through that emotional barrier to get them to people's heads. But like you said, you know, anybody can start a blog. And with what I do uh, with the normal network, you know, I was doing Normal's podcast, and then I turn it into a live show. And I start looking around the internet, and gosh, there's lots of people doing this, doing podcasts. And, and they're from all sorts of different uh, places in the country. And now we've got podcasters from you know, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, Asheville, North Carolina, Boston, uh, Kalispell, Montana, Des Moines, Iowa. And, and hearing, it, it's very important, I think, for those of us out here in the West Coast, living in the land of milk and honey, so to speak, oh, to, yeah. to hear guys in Missouri talking about the round town brown and, the, <laughs> and, and what they're going through if they're caught with a seed in their car. I mean, it's just, uh, we need to be informed of that. And, and I think the internet is, is giving rise to that voice. And it's also made it, it's made it, I, I think the current generation growing up that's, you know, grown up with medical marijuana and with the internet, cannot be bullshitted by the reefer madness anymore because they can google it they can just look it up and get 10 different citations of why the gateway theory isn't true or why you know you're not going to uh, have greater risk of cancer from using cannabis than using tobacco it's just uh, i'm so glad that we have this tool available to us now russ is exactly on point with that because uh when people in states like alabama or in the Midwest, states that don't have medical marijuana yet, and it may be a while before they have it, they see bud pictures that I put out there. Oh. They see dispensary views that I put out there. And these aren't just teases, they're also powerful ideas. Right. Because people see these columns and they think, wait a minute, why can't we have it that way here? Well, That's you right. can get politically active, change the laws, and you can have it in any state in the union. Yeah. And the blogs help to amplify, you know, the reddits and all that. Uh, when a story hits uh, and can go viral and, and change the entire complexion of the of the argument, the uh, YouTube video of the Columbia, Missouri SWAT raid where the dogs are shot, you can yeah. hear the dogs yelping and the right, sun right, being right. let out, went viral. Millions and millions mm -hmm. of hits and led to, you know, that Columbia, Missouri Police Department, have, you know, getting the book thrown at them. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of stories like that where, you know, they get passed around from person to person and the next thing you know, it's it's the big news story. And now we're starting to see media, uh, the main, what we might call traditional media, I don't like mainstream, but tra traditional media actually scouring the blog feeds and the Twitter feeds to find what the next story is. Mm -hmm. Two recent ones, the Patricia Spotted Crow story, the young uh, mother in Oklahoma who got sentenced to uh, 10 years in prison for selling $31 worth of weed. That's terrible. Yeah, and, and the other story that uh, uh, just broke recently too, uh, in New York City where the woman, uh, the Bronx police searched her uh, apartment she had less than 10 grams of weed. It was such a low amount that the prosecutor wouldn't press charges, but the cops called child services. They took away her kid for a week and her foster kid for a year That's vindictive. for something she wasn't even charged for. It's vindictive. But remember, uh, who is it? Was it Lincoln or Voltaire? Never expect a man to understand you if his job depends on not understanding Upton you. Upton Sinclair. There you go. They all look alike to me. The point is... <laughs> I forgot my point. <laughs> Maybe but, that was but the internet and, and, and media and, and doing TV shows and, and you know writing to your newspaper and putting together your own little fanzine or your own magazine. I clearly got into the magazine business on the how hard can it be theory. And, uh, and you know, how hard can it be? It's pretty yeah. fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought about live radio too. <laughs> I should have bought a longer mat, but no. Uh, you know. But uh, yeah, buy an ad. But um, yeah, just be active and you know, stay involved. And and when you're talking to the media or dealing with the brand, dress up at protests. 
You know what I'm saying? Say cannabis, don't say pot. And, and the nature of internet media too is a whole lot more um, interactive and personalized and yeah. community oriented. Because of the shows we're doing right now on Normal Network, there are 14 people attending Hempfest this year that's never attended it because they heard about it on the show. That guy right there is from Britain, came all the way from the UK, does a show oh, on wow. our network. That's Cannabis Cure UK. Check out the Cannabis Cure UK podcast. He's fun to follow on Twitter, too. No, I'm the only one. Right. <laughs> Did you have something to say, Morgan? You look like you wanted to say something. No, I can't think of anything at the moment. Are there any other questions? What's it going to take for there to be a publication uh, the price has to come down, dude. I look into it every two months. I call my printer. I'm like, is it cheaper yet? Well, like, no. We give out the magazine free, and if if we were to use all hemp in the magazine, one, the, the paper quality is is fairly good, but it wouldn't be as shiny. Um, two, it would double our printing costs. Yeah, I got a, I got a similar story. This is my trademark hat. It's made of hemp, 100% hemp. It's a great conversation starter. People walk by and go, nice hat. And I say, yeah, it's 100% hemp. I'm a true pothead. And then we start talking, right? Uh, so I went back to the head shop where I got it, and there was none left. And I said, you know, where's where's that hat? You know, that great hat with the pot leaf, the hemp hat. Oh, we don't carry those anymore. Well, why not? Well, the company doesn't make them anymore. Well, why not? Too expensive to import the hemp. Yes. We start growing our own hemp. That's the next step. So, if, you know, I'm down. I got a small patch of land in the back of my house. You want to bankroll my industrial hemp? Oh, that would be actually be pretty cool. Yeah. It's the hash. I'm all rambly. <laughs> but that would be really cool if you had like a hemp-filled printing press out in the middle of your farm somewhere and you could print your magazines on it. All right. As I get older, I'll aspire to that. That's good shit. One thing I would say to anyone who wants to see better cannabis coverage in the media is to demand it. Demand accountability, demand accuracy. When you see bad reporting on cannabis, call the reporter on it. Write them an email. Let them know that you know better. I know that this has an impact on members of the media because most stories don't get much reader feedback. If you get three emails or a couple of calls about a story, that is going to be something that reporter remembers. If he or she reports misinformation on cannabis and gets corrected on it, then we possibly have someone who is going to be doing a better job next time. So right. if, if you demand this kind of better reporting on cannabis from your media, you're likely to get it. You're a lot more likely to get it than if you don't. Writing in the comment box doesn't count. <laughs> For real. Letters to the editor do. Yes. Yeah. You have a question there. And then we'll get over there. It turns out that uh, Village Voice Media has something like talent scouts out there on the web. And uh, what I did with Reality Catcher, which was my personal blog, was go on Dig, which is one of the news aggregation sites that Sean was talking about. And uh, on Dig, it got some attention, it got a few page hits, and then it got a few more page hits, and pretty soon uh, it got enough so that Village Voice Media noticed and offered me a uh, twice weekly pot column with the SF Weekly on their online blog. That's what, uh, after a few months, turned into Toke of the Town. They decided that the pot thing was getting so much attention that they wanted in on it. And, uh, you know, like, Anything that is generating this amount of public attention becomes profitable to mass media. They were smart enough to realize that, and uh, since I was already working for them at the SF Weekly, they asked me to do Talk of the Town. Just a little follow-up. What's the demographic that you're reaching with, with uh, Talk of the Town? I don't have really good information on that. I know that it skews male um, 30s right now, but I do know also that I'm uh, reaching some other groups too, more than ever before. Uh, that's part of a conscious effort to do that. I know when I started out that um, they were kind of encouraging me to run more scantily clad babes than I was doing, and uh, you know, they were saying do anything that will get you the page hits. I had to prove I could get them without that before they stopped leaning on me to do that. Page hits are page hits, so if you get them, then they back away and let you run your own show. So then how do you end up finding that balance between getting those page hits and getting the content out that people want to see? Like, how do you get the right message into what you're trying to say while still getting people to look at it? 
that's a matter, I think, of uh, snappy writing, both in your headline, which is vitally important. Skill and talent. Bad headline to a good story, you're, you're not going to get many people reading it. And then once you get them in the story, you better make that thing good and snappy and just keep hitting them and make them want to read that next paragraph. Um, here's key, too. Make it something that they want to share with their friends. Facebook has been very good to me because if you make a shareable story, somebody reads it and they think, you know, all my friends need to see this. That's pure gold for page hits. Uh, uh, things I would add to that, you know, the headline writing is crucial. Uh, one of the th complaints we get at normal is when people go, don't see marijuana, it's racist, say cannabis. Which I dig, I understand it, the plant is cannabis. But as far as Google hits, Google search hits, marijuana is 10 times the hits cannabis gets. And pot is three letters in a tweet, right? So, you know, you're gonna see pot, you're gonna see marijuana. I try to make it marijuana or pot in the headline to bring them in, but in the story, it's cannabis that we're talking about all throughout. I use the terms like interchangeably for that very same reason. I like hashtag med pot when I'm talking about <laughs> medical cannabis or just pot. Another thing, uh, another thing uh, to get those stories shared and, and popular is to watch the length of them. Internet, you know, everything's going real quick. If, it, if it's more than two clicks in that story to scroll down, they're not going to bother. Keep it short. Which I violate all the time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've heard you speak. <laughs> <laughs> Remember earlier? Cause yeah, it was, see, it's a callback in the car. <sighs> I call that. It's still early. The brownies uh, haven't kicked this thing on. Sean, is there something you wanted to say about Reddit or whatnot? Or anything in general? What do you think of the internet? <laughs> uh, we managed to keep it short on our site, and that's part of what makes it fun, is that uh, people can speak very casually. And, um, you know, with Toke of the Town, uh, like with Steve, it's great because we get the news out there. And then a site with like trees uh, gets to discuss it, and people get to discuss it at their leisure in short bits. Not not as short as Twitter, thank goodness, um, but uh, short enough where it can be easily digested and enjoyed, even while you're are um, possibly under the influence of cannabis. And um, it, you know that's another great thing too, is letting people just be able to discuss things at their leisure instead of. Um, you know, just like we would in uh, everyday conversation. That's important to um, be able to uh, interact in that manner, that sort of casual way. Uh, because, um, uh, you know, we have the, the formal, the traditional media, and um, it's, it's just great to have forums where people can go and um, just write whatever's on their mind uh, at any time of day. And that's, uh, that's, that's what I think the internet's great for. I gotta say that uh, as someone who runs a blog, I love Reddit because it fosters discussion and it fosters connection with your material. When these people on Reddit get to discuss an article in length, that means that they are connected to that article and uh, that fosters community, that kind of discussion where they're working out the, what they think of that particular article. Not only that, but of course it, it's good for uh, page hits and, and more and more people read that article that might not otherwise have seen it. On that same topic um, about other people not being able to, you wouldn't otherwise see it. One thing that I find is problematic with the internet at least is that you seem to be preaching to the choir sometimes. That you have like-minded individuals who already do not buy and agree for madness and that's why they're there. How can we reach that to be able to bring in other individuals who would be things like swing voters in the internet media? Well, I think Steve had the right point when he says when they share it on the Facebook or when they share it on their social media with their friends, not all of their friends are stoners. Some of their friends are squares. You know what I'm saying? But that will open their mind to really what's going on. And like Morgan was saying, when you get on TV and you have good arguments with these politicians and you create national television, not just internet or, or niche programming, but national television events, um, Harborside from Oakland is going to be on the Discovery Channel. They shot a whole reality series, relatively conflict-free, uh, and that's going to come out in October. Things like that to further, to make sure the squares, I say squares, civilians, non-regularly cannabis-using people get a chance to still be open-minded about it, right? People, There are people who don't drink, but they still don't mind beer and alcohol being legal. Another thing I'd add to that, too, is 
uh, don't make your stories necessarily have uh, marijuana as the star of the story. Not every marijuana story is a story about marijuana. It's sometimes a story about privacy, about freedom, about gun rights, about parenting, about, you know, there's a lot of ways to frame the story that, you know, it could be, a, you know, Ricky Williams, a sports story, right? Where a guy that I might talk to at a bar at a Packers game could care less about marijuana, but once we start talking Ricky Williams, the running back, now I got a way to wedge that story in there, get his attention. It's also really important to develop relationships with people that have a wide audience. I mean, if you're trying to get people to, uh, you know, uh, forward your stories out there, uh, try to get on good terms with somebody that has a really wide and diverse audience so that when they do forward it, it means a lot more than when somebody with like, you know, five Facebook friends does. Andrew Sullivan's been great that way. The yeah, conservative absolutely. writer has come around on the marijuana issue and he picked up a story and he'll tweet that out or to, to his followers who aren't our choir and man, that's great. It does have a way of filtering through, uh, the information does, to the non-cannabis using audience. And I, I think sometimes that the function of the cannabis friendly media is to make certain things so obvious that the mainstream media can't ignore them any longer. Sometimes that's what it takes to get coverage from mainstream media is when it just becomes ridiculous for them not to say anything about the story any longer. Right, like when cannabis becomes the number one question on the Ask the President <laughs> exactly. town hall meeting and he's got to address it. Perfect example. Cannabis, you carry did you know? Uh, yeah, um, when uh, attacking or sorry, approaching uh, the mainstream media about the reef of madness that they consistently put out say for example in the UK where 30,000 people a year die of cannabis use, uh, what sort of steps should we take to try and uh, defeat that or approach that? Well, science always wins out. Uh, you just have to make it sexy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I was saying before, uh, instead of uh, them concentrating on the, uh, you know, the fear tactics that prohibitionists use, if you create a story hook, then they'll follow you instead. So, I mean, actively calling out the people that are using misinformation and doing it in a way that publicly embarrasses them uh, is really a great way to uh, get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of coverage of the fact that you actually have the facts. We could offer them money to prove it. Show me that I have five thousand quid right here. Show me that. <laughs> Show me your citation, sir. Your facts are not in order, sir. And, and I, I have to commend uh, our cousins across the pond for their bon vivant reefer madness. Oh, my Is God. Is that French? Yes, they just have amazing, wonderful reefer madness. Do they have crazy reefer madness? Is it really bad over there? Oh, my God. Okay? Oh, it's, oh. it's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> if you have one puff of marijuana, you'll uh, go and kill your whole entire family, and then... Uh, but, but look at what it did for the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> you think they'd love it. It's, it's, it's not liked at all, but it's super skunk is killing your children one by one. That's really funny because I found it relatively easy to find hash when I was there in, in London. But we, you know, London's probably different. It's so. funny how the mainstream press can be so clueless as to latch on that term skunk for a particular strain of marijuana. Yeah. And somehow they've decided, the British tabloid press at least, have decided that this is actually deadly. And, and they will tell you that it will kill you, that it will make you crazy. And they have people who believe that stuff. So it is really, really important to get the actual facts out there in a case like that. We have legislation based on that misinformation. The UK took away their decrim and made cannabis back worse against the law like it was before on the basis of tabloid coverage of skunk. Wow, that's the, um, the William Hurst 1937 thing all over again. Exactly, it's the same old nightmare bad legislation due to bad journalism and, and you know just know what they're doing and you know we, we've said it over and over again confront these media sources that are spewing this reefer madness stuff uh, I, I like to I like to look at the, the little subtle things they do like you'll notice that it's never a marijuana bust it's a drug bust mm -hmm. it's not a marijuana garden it's drug manufacturing and in the UK, marijuana lab even yeah in the UK it's a cannabis factory a marijuana <laughs> lab I hate marijuana lab I've called a couple of mainstream journalists out on that one and uh, uh, and sometimes they a bunch of guys in white back. coats yeah <laughs> or the, the one I love for the media how I've experimented with marijuana <laughs> how many years does it have to be I mean we've had since prop 19 uh, or I'm sorry prop 215 right 1996 15. and how many how many times have you guys read the media refer to a marijuana prescription yeah it's a just this week <laughs> it's a recommendation not only that but uh, judges lawyers prosecutors yeah use 
Yeah. yeah, the attorney general I of this state copy. used the term prescription for marijuana just within the past week. And yeah. uh, this is the top law enforcement official in Washington state right. who appears to be completely clueless about our own marijuana law. I mean, he's only had 13 years to learn about it. Well, it's, you know, it's pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> Boring. He's, a, he's a slow reader. <laughs> it's easier just to throw people in jail. Something else I've seen used is... Uh, the attachment of marijuana to a situation. Somebody gets in a car accident, there was marijuana. Alcohol and marijuana were found in the car. I have I have the perfect example of it just happened this week. Headline read, marijuana, comma, child born, found at molester's home. And when they actually, just six paragraphs down, when they tell you how much marijuana it was, 0.97 of a gram. Well, wouldn't child porn be first? <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking. It's like marijuana and child porn. Found in the same <laughs> There's another great example recently of uh, a kid in Florida who like bludgeoned his parents to death and most of the coverage was about the party that he had and the fact that people were drinking beer and smoking marijuana. Yes. The narrative we get from the mainstream media is often that this uh, medical marijuana is this new idea that's unproven and uh, there's really not much known about it. What they don't tell you when they say things like that is that people have been using cannabis medicinally for 10,000 years easily. It's been found in ancient tombs in China and Europe. People have always used this for medicine and up until our cultural knowledge was stolen from us by marijuana prohibition, this was something that almost any housewife would know. Yeah, we, we just have prohibition because of media and framing. Uh, we, you know, the first uh, hemp plantations were 1611. We're in the 400th anniversary of hemp being planted. Happy uh, birthday in America, that's right. And, and come around 1937, if you'd have tried to tell people, well, we're gonna ban cannabis, we're gonna ban hemp, they'd gone, why, what the hell are you doing? So they, they used framing, they changed it to marijuana. marijuana. They associated it with the scary the Mexicans. Devil's weed. And, and, you know, Mexicans and jazz musicians. <laughs> so when we uh, when we talk about, you know, the power of the media here, I mean, we're, we're here at Hempfest because of media. You know, yellow journalism of the 30s is what brought us here. And you can see how powerful that is in the fact that we all know the facts and, and, and the science is out there, and yet prohibition persists. It's all about the emotion. It's all about the way the brain thinks, not the not the logic and the science necessarily. You'll find that a lot of times the prohibitionists, rather than trying to engage the intellect, they will try to engage the emotions, as Russ just said. It's fear tactics. When people start fearing, they stop thinking, and that's the reason the first thing the prohibitionists want you to do is be scared of marijuana. They, they want to tell you that it is this horrible skunk weed that is going to drive you crazy or make you bludgeon your family to death. Or make you sterile. That goes straight to your emotions and they want to bypass your intellect. Well, you know, use your head, think about it, depend on the science and not on the hysteria. Time to get them more scared of prohibition than the marijuana that's being prohibited. There you go. Right. Better money. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better money. It's a win-win. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I think one or two more questions, and then are we, what time are we supposed to stop? I have no concept uh, yeah, of time. Four minutes. Well, we have four minutes. Thank you, Russ, for being the timekeeper <laughs> and the gatekeeper. Did you have a question, sir? Yes, I did. Um, what benefits do each of you get from standing up? Oh, of course. I mean, heck, it's the 21st century. Everybody's a star. Everybody's got a blog. Everybody's got a YouTube channel. Everybody's got a Reddit page. Everybody's got a digging thing. Everybody's got a Twitter feed. Everybody's got a Facebook. The more people who know, it's the more people who know, right? So you have to disseminate. You never know who the hundredth monkey is, if you know what I'm saying, where the tipping point should be reached. So speak out. I mean, don't be an asshole. You know, don't be that guy, dog, Joe, you're always on about weed. Well, that's what it's all about. It's just like, try to, you know what I'm saying? When, when people start talking about oil production or legalization or something like that, chip in and have something intelligent and, 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 and right to say and lead people to the right path so they can make the right decisions for themselves. I think we're all headed the right way. The send, more you send, learn. send a letter to my magazine, Chip, we'll publish it. The more you learn about it, the better you're going to be at talking about it to others. And uh, if, if you are informed and in command of your facts, you can change people's minds. Right. 
I think uh, everybody has to find the level at which they're comfortable speaking out. Not everybody, you know, people have jobs, families they got to worry about. I understand some people can't come out of the closet, you know, so to speak. Uh, so the benefit I get out, out of the grow room, the grow room, there you go. The benefit that I get out of this is the feeling that I, I, I get to speak out for a lot of people that can't you know, because of their situation or their geographic location or whatever. So you gotta find out, you know, what, where that level is for you. Obviously, I'm all in, right? I have Google Google footprint a mile wide. I'm never getting another corporate job again. It's never gonna happen, so I'm kinda all in on this. But, uh, you know, find your own level and do what you can. What Russ said. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be very interesting in California on the legalization front this year. I just regret that it's kind of the first part instead of focusing on one of them. Man, don't, we, we only have two minutes left. Don't even get me started on the state of California legalization initiative proceedings. It ain't just California. There's three in California, four in Oregon, two in Washington, two in Colorado. It's everywhere. Yeah, I don't don't let people split your vote. Just vote yes on all of them, and let the lawyers figure it out while you smoke weed and stay out of jail. <laughs> About ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Ten more. <laughs> I just tell another joke. All right. Uh, <laughs> pirate walks into a bar with a steering wheel around his waist. The bartender says, "Why is that steering wheel around your waist?" The pirate goes, "Ah, it's driving me nuts." Okay. <laughs> That's an excellent point uh, because if by the way you argue you make people feel dumb, they stop listening right then and right. they're not That's interested right. in anything else you have to say. If you can make them feel empowered by what you're telling them, if you can make them feel smart, like I know that you can appreciate this and tell them that way, then they're going to listen. And when you do that, people will seek you out too. I mean, one of the best aspects of working in this field is that when you stand up and start speaking out, people will search you out and I mean... The amazing people that I've met uh, uh, doing this sort of thing is amazing. I mean, it's really mind blowing. But you're absolutely right. If you treat people with respect and make them, uh, you know, leave it, any sort of discussion feeling like they benefited from that, then they'll tell their friends, and people will come to you to, uh, you know, talk about these issues and start to learn a lot more. Exactly. Uh, almost every time. Yeah, you also, uh, I, I found, if, I grew up in Idaho where, you know, who com completely, <laughs> Idaho. Uh, it's a completely different situation than living in Oregon, but I, I found myself arguing many times with very conservative, very, you know, born again Christian type religious people. And in those arguments, I found it was a lot easier to convince them to hate prohibition than to like pot. And so I started getting away from, all right. They don't even really have to like that they do it. They can still think it's dirty, evil, yeah, 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 yeah. disgusting habit. Just don't throw me in prison. <laughs> Just don't right. lock me up for that. Right. That'd be fine. I'm not a big drinker, but I don't think you should go to jail if you get drunk and vomit on your shoes. I don't care. So That's sometimes your in your arguments, you know, find yeah. ways of appealing to what they already feel or think. For example, with, with my conservative friends at, back in Idaho who didn't like pot and mostly think of it as dirty, stinky hippies and all, I would say, gee, why do you let them live a tax-free lifestyle then? <laughs> why do you let them make a living with no taxes, no regulations? If you taxed them and regulated them, they'd probably go away. They wouldn't like that, would they? Oh, well, I never thought of that. Right. Now think of a way around them. And there are, are ways to pitch your message to, to whichever audience you're dealing with. I have friends back in Alabama who are part of the Alabama Medical Marijuana Coalition, and you would think that's a hopeless case, but it's not because they have been smart enough to pitch their message. The sponsor of their bill in next year's legislature is a conservative Christian Republican member of the Alabama legislature. 
how they are pitching it successfully is let's get the federal government off our backs. That message resonates in Alabama and they are going to have a medical marijuana bill in next spring's legislature. That's a good point. Let's hear it again for Steve and Radical Russ and Morgan and Sean. Uh, and Gaio Bilo. And Gaio, that's me, westcoastcannabis.com, when we get the website back up. You can actually get copies of, you can get free copies of West Coast Cannabis at Booth 813, way up by Dr. Bronner's foam thingy. Um, they're free, so grab one or two, send me emails and stuff. Anybody have any closing things they want to say before we break it up? If anybody has the opportunity to uh, ask uh, a marijuana-related question to uh, any of the uh, people that are in the running for the Republican primary, please do it and send us your videos. The more eyeballs we can get on that, the better. Yeah, I mean, we together. need to make these guys accountable for their position. There was just one with Michelle Bachman completely ignoring a, a medical marijuana question in states' rights. States' because she's all you know, Tea Party and states' rights. They got to go back. Oh, that. I right. hope she gets the moment. Uh, encourage people to listen to live.normal.org. We're actually on the internet right now. We, this whole thing's been streaming live, and we're live backstage as well. So I'll give I'll have plenty of these to give to you with the address on it. Hey, Sean. I see some very distinguished people out here, and I'm honored to have been a part of this. Hello, Jody. Is it Jody Ryan? Free Mark Emery. Hey, there she is, Jody Emery.